Uh, hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. Uh, so today we have uh, DJ Demolet presenting on new insights in hot stuff phonetics and phonology. Uh, DJ is now an emeritus professor, uh, but he was a professor at University of Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris, um, and he worked at the Laboratory for Phonetics and Phonology. He was also the director of the Institute of Linguistics and General and Applied Phonetics. His research interests include the development of experimental methods in phonetics, the description of new phenomena in the phonetic and phonological systems of the world's languages, and ethnomusicology. Okay, thank you for the presentation, Anne. Uh, well, hello to everybody, and so it's such a pleasure to see all these uh, nice faces and, and nice colleagues. And so sorry if I repeat myself from other things that I've said before. I didn't know how to whom I was going to speak, but I see that there's probably only specialists now. So I might go quite quickly in the beginning and show some of the things that we have been doing uh, in the last time with Alain on the on the Hatsa material. And so, well, feel free to interrupt me if you want. I think that uh, should be okay. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to say a few general words about clicks. Uh, show things about the Hadza clicks. That wouldn't be a surprise for uh, Bonnie, Tom, uh, Andrew, uh, Richard, and uh, and uh, Jeremy. Uh, I want to show a uh, discuss an issue about the timing of gestures that we have from aerodynamics uh, data, and that give uh, aerodynamic data gives some nice evidence for the timing of gestures. Discuss the thing about click features, and then I will say a word about adjectives and quinasalized consonants that we have in Hadza. All these data have been partially processed, but so uh, you will see what we have done. So, the, one of the goals that we have in working on these things is describe Hadza clicks in terms of gestures with a measure of time and put that in the perspective of distinctive futures. We want to check and establish the accompaniments of the different clicks. Uh, one of the questions that we, we want to pursue is, is there, are there similarities and differences with the clicks of the Southern Quezon languages? Uh, there was one question that we started to work and that uh, it's Andrew and Richard who open our eyes. Uh, are they aspirated clicks in Hatsa? And I think it is pretty obvious that there are. Uh, and we want to evaluate uh, similarity between clicks and adjectives and see how some nice di diachronical question can be addressed uh, looking at uh, this question. So it's not a surprise. That's why I go quite fast now uh, for, for most of you. Hadza has non pulmonic consonants, click and adjectives in phonemic phonologic inventory. I think a precise articulatory and acoustic description is necessary to characterize and formalize these consonants in terms of articulatory gestures and distinctive futures. I just said it, but I think it's nice to repeat that. Uh, the challenge is to understand the mechanism of the production of these segments and understand how this type of data assesses or extends the limits of all knowledge on the diversity and functioning of speech production in languages. And I will come back to that point in the last part of the presentation, because I went back to something that Bonnie and Tom said before about the, the oldness of clicks, and we might have a nice discussion about that uh, later. So just the thing that what I what we have, and uh, maybe Jeremy has new things to say, I uh, will see for the discussion, but that's the base of our work. Uh, we think that uh, recent data show that uh, there are 13 clicks. Well, everything has started by Bonnie's work with Yen and, and Peter, then there was later work by Boni and uh, uh, and uh, Miller. And so we think that there are 13 clicks. They have two types of clicks with various types of accompaniments. And the four Hadza clicks can be bilabial, dental, alveolar, and lateral. And uh, they can be accompanied in a contrastive way by aspirated glottal nasal features that can sometimes be combined and three can we see. So a click can just be described as a series of features or a superposition of gestures, for example, nasal, lateral, and aspirated uh, in the example that I just showed. From an acoustic point of view, clicks can be described with two features, grave and acute, abrupt and noisy. Uh, it just follows a, an old proposition made by Tony Trail. And I think, for example, if you look at uh, the Hadza click, the dental and, alt, and alveolar uh, Hadza clicks, 
they are acute and noisy, abrupt and grave. And then there is something special about the lateral click that I would like very much to discuss with you because we have been describing that as abrupt and acute, but they, that can be discussed and that will be part of the final discussion that we will have today. So uh, just to remind everybody how clicks are, uh, I recently made on myself uh, for a reason that I was privileged to do that, uh, um, X-ray movies on the production of clicks, ejectives, and implosives. And so here you will have the production of a swallowing, then you will have an alveolar click, swallowing again, and uh, the lateral click. So there will no, there, there is no sound for that, but you are all experts, and so I think probably you will have no difficulties to recognize it. So here is the swallowing, the alveolar, swallowing again, and this is the palatal click, okay? So the data are available, there's no secret, everybody can have uh, this movie, there's no problem for that. So I was, I'm just repeating myself, okay, so well, wait, that is the so second swallowing, and this is the palatal click, okay. So in articulatory description, which is clearly not enough, uh, I think this is the traditional way of looking at the at the clicks, but I want to insist on the fact that it is very important to look at these things from an articulatory point of view, from an acoustic point of view. So clicks are consonants that have a unique source uh, that is uh, suction caused by lingual initiation. The results can be an impulse source or a noise of a certain duration, and these parameters are filtered by the shapes of the shapes of the oral cavity, which are associated with each click. The acoustic signatures encode the dimensions of the vocal tract. As for the consonants where the acoustic signature particularly encodes those which are in front of the constrictions. But in the case of some clicks, it is the cavity posterior to the constriction that is excited, and I will show you an, uh, a few examples of that. So first of all, if you look at clicks, uh, it's just to set the issues, just to know what we are talking about. Huh? Uh, clicks have acoustically two components, an attack transient, that is, for example, the, if my arrow is visible here, the, the red arrow here, and an extinction transient. I, I took this example because it was uh, quite clear to, to show. The attack transient is the explosion noise, sometimes called a burst, which is the impulse noise to a change in the shape of the vocal tract, and the extin extinction transient is the noise associated with the turbulent release. And I, I have put here four typical acoustic uh, waveforms of the bilabial click, uh, the dental click, the uh, alveolar, and the palatal click that we found in Hatsa. We've been looking at uh, all the examples that we have, and we're pretty sure that this is the the real pattern that we have. And that will be discussed later when we will look at the spectral analysis of the clicks. So I just want to say a little word about the posterior cavity because I think that it has some importance and uh, some effects on, on a number of issues in the phonetics and phonology of Hadza. For example, if you look at the example here, uh, you, you have a, a, a um, Wait, wait, because uh, the, the black thing is uh, obscuring my uh, screen. So you have a dental, uh, a, a nasal, a, a dental, nasal, and glottal click here, where, where you have uh, this resonance that you have here, you have this resonance here, and this resonance here. You have that with the dental, with the alveolar, and with the palatal click. I took each time a glottal, uh, a, a, glot, a glottal click, let's put it like that and may even if in the two, the first and the last case is nasal too. By the way, it's uh, voiceless nasal, I should have put that. But what the interesting thing is that this little resonance that here is the product of the resonance that you have in the back cavity. When you lower the tongue dorsum at the, the second release of the click, there is a sharp downward, downward movement of the, the tongue body, which excites the back cavity. And typically what you have in that case is this little resonance that you have here. It's slightly above 1000, uh, 1000 hertz here. And I took deliberately the glottal click because since the glottis is, is closed or almost closed because you have some noise accompanying that, but uh, that 
that is just to show that this back cavity has some importance in the phonetic, at least in the phonetic uh, details of the clicks production in Hatsa. And the second thing that I uh, want to show you, if I can retrieve, okay, is the relevance uh, uh, of uh, of features in clicks uh, identification. And I think this is something that we want to develop because I think I took the same examples, but there is one key point if you want to uh, understand how perceptually uh, click works. Uh, first of all, this is the auditory system does a very fast frequency duration and intensity analysis to make the distinction between the different clicks. All the information lies in the birth noise. There are no co-articulation effects involved in this case. And I think this is an old idea that was put forward by uh, Tony Trail. If I remember, it was presented at the first workout that Tony was saying, well, all the information lies in the click birth in these cases. And that is very important because this is very, very small events. Uh, it's less than 25 milliseconds. And so the auditory system makes an auditory analysis in terms of uh, frequency, duration, and intensity just to ident identify the clicks. And this is, if we get out of the simply looking at Hadza uh, and African languages, I think these are clear cases where we, we are reaching the limits of the human auditory capacities. And I think clicks are very exciting for these issues. And personally, I'm very, uh, very interested in this point. So I just wanted to underline that a little bit in the beginning, and maybe we can come back to this discussion later. So let me try to get my thing back again. Okay. So two, two little things before starting to look at concrete data. The anterior articulators, the apex and the tongue blade move at different speed with the clicks. There is a difference between the apical clicks uh, and the lateral click where the tongue blade extends backward during the production before the release. This movement of the back of the tongue is slower for aspirated clicks compared to non-aspirated one, and this can be quantified, and I will show you a couple of examples uh, later. And for noisy clicks, after releasing the anterior closer, closure, there is an in initial increase in loudness, which increases to a peak and then decreases. It is a measure of how quickly the anterior part of the tongue moves away from its place of articulation. So these are very tiny details, but shows that this idea of timing and control that becomes in the fashion in some phonological circles can be addressed by, by, by in, in a better way and in a kind of model in the click studies and particularly in the examples of Hatsa that we have here. So, and the last thing is the back of the tongue moves away more slowly from the velum with the aspirated clicks compared to non-aspirated ones. Any future interpretation that would distinguish these sounds simply in terms of the state of the glottis would not be completely adequate. And I think this is an important point. All the segments discussed require to account very precisely for the relative coordination of the articulatory movements. These adjustments of the larynx and the movement of the velarium, which control nasal flow. So this coordination specification are not directly related one to one with the phonological features. This is not from me. I should have quoted that more uh, nicely. It has been done in the famous paper done by uh, Tony Trail and Peter Ladefogut. The, the, the coordination of uh, phonological features and phonetic features that we have in clicks, we have no one-to-one -one, uh, coordination in that. And I think it's a real challenge, and I think a, a real challenge for, let's say, phonetics and phonological theory or for speech studies, and that is still not solved these things. And the reason why I want personally to look at so many little details, and I think the devil is in the details for these things, the more detail we will understand, the more we will understand how it works, the more we will be able to address this question of the relation between, let's say, phonetic cues and phonological futures. And we will continue this discussion now. So three types of accompaniments uh, for the clicks. You have laryngeal activity, oral nasal processes, place and manner of back release. And for the things that we have uh, in Hatsa, I have just put the nasal voice and voiceless, uh, the, well, let's see, uh, pharyngeal uh, things, and we have the, 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 the glottal thing. So we have 
simultaneity of gestures and little or no co-articulation. I think that they might see a, a little bit of co-articulation when you have the nasal uh, the nasal clicks, but I'm not sure that, uh, that that is correct what I what I what I say now about that. But certainly there is the little co-articulation uh, is 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 a true fact for the for the answer. So what we did also is just a, a very small example. We measured the duration of the clicks. It's just for four Hadza speakers. We have, in fact, in total, a, a total of 10 speakers, male and uh, female speakers. So the, the point here is that in blue, you have the, the duration of the dental click. You have the alveolar click and you have the lateral click and the mean duration is quite different from for the two different clicks. And you have the three main accompaniments duration for the clicks here. You have the, the glottal, it's in orange, you have the nasal, and you have the aspirated here. So there's, there, there is also a, a duration pattern for the click accompaniments. That should be worked in more details. Uh, we are working on that, but we haven't been much further than that for the moment in the things. So just to remind uh, to, 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 to remind things for the Hadza clicks, these are data that we had uh, we nicely got from Andrew and Richard when we were in Tanzania. So these are the data that I'm going to present and, and discuss now, and that have everything that uh, need to, to be discussed. Uh, so the, the, the material that we have been using is the Eva machine. We have a new one, but I don't I'm not going to talk about that today. Is just to show you have the transducers here. You have a mouthpiece uh, that's put on the, on the on the cheeks. The microphone is here. We can measure. We have a, an EGD, and we can measure also intraoral pressure by passing it through either through the nose or between the lips. Uh, so what you have here is the audio waveform in green. Sorry, I don't in green. You have the oral airflow, pharyngeal pressure, and the signature of the EGG signal. And we are going to look at that in detail now. So what I want to show you is probably an example that some of you have already seen. Uh, it's by label click uh, by filming the person uh, uh, face and front by putting a small mirror on the side. We can see the the, 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 the articulation quite nicely. So here it is. Okay. So if we now shift to, uh, uh, we, we, we have a small camera, which is not exceptional. This is a, a, a Casio camera that allows you to make up to 1000 image per second. If you reduce that to 300 frames per second, we have this kind of movie. It, it requires quite a lot of flights, but this case I think is acceptable. And so what you will have here is the, 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 the movements that we have, uh, the slow motion, let me just put it on, sorry. Uh, should do it like that, okay, it's coming. So it's 300 frames per second, lip pressure, lip opening and lip retraction. So you can see that in the slow motion from, from the face and the side. And I had a student last year who, who processed all the 10 subjects that we had with the, for the bilingual click, they made a master, it's a master, first year master. So she studied uh, the patterns of bilingual click production by looking at the video movies, aerodynamics and electrographic data. And there are some nice things coming out from that. First of all, if you compare uh, the male and the female speaker that we have here. In phase one, you have the lip closure and the lip pressure. In phase two, you have a lip protrusion. Phase three, you have the lip opening. And phase four, you have uh, the retraction of the lower jaw and that, uh, that accounts for the opening uh, of the vocal. It's absolutely systematic. There are ten, all the speakers have been processed. All of you who want to have a copy of that master, uh, feel free to ask me a copy of that. It's written in French, but I think that uh, that's not a big problem to, to, to read. So what the student has done uh, is all, was also to look at the coordination of uh, uh, lip closure and lip aperture. So you have intraoral pressure that was measured with a tube between the lips in, in that case, uh, that is given in red here. And in green, you have the oral airflow. So here is the point where the, the two lips are closed. 
here is the point where the there is the, the expansion of the oral cavity between the lips and let's say the, the closure made at the by the tongue dorsum either in the villa or in the uvula area that i cannot specify and you have here the moment of the lip opening and in green you see that uh, when the lip opens there is a negative oral airflow which accounts that there has been an increase in the volume of the oral cavity that has been processed for all the speakers the pattern is completely regular so i don't want to annoy you now by statistical measurements but if you want i will gladly pass you all the measurements and uh, and the statistics that go uh, that go with that Acoustically, there is an interesting thing too that to look at when you have uh, this by bi this bilabial click is that in some of the cases, the first case here, that's probably I forgot to put the second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you have here is the, the abrupt release of the lips, and then you have an increase uh, of the noise uh, here, and that shows the increase of intensity of the noise. But if the lips are not completely pressed on at the moment, you have this kind of whistle-like uh, signature that you have here. It's a bit like if you whistle by inspiring air, uh, air at the time. So that we have a few examples and few realizations of that that shows that the, 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 the control on the lip closure is pretty viable. It's the same speaker in the same, in, in, in the same recording in, in, in that case. I will add uh, for the for, for the, the recordings the, 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 the recording of the second example. What the student has also found is her name is Elizabeth Oliagahai. She has found something that surprises me quite a lot, and I was pretty skeptical when she showed me that. You have an EDG pattern and a, laryn and a typical laryngeal movement with the bilabial click, and that we also find with, with the other clicks is that you have here, and this is the time where there is the, the lip opening, and so you have the nasal part is here. And then you have the, the time of the click where you have a downward movement of the larynx and an upward movement of the larynx. That is absolutely typical. I thought that it was going to be variable. It's absolutely systematic. And we have found some very interesting patterns of uh, well, glottal and laryngeal movements in, uh, in Hatsa that I'm going to discuss later when we're going to compare clicks and uh, ejectives. So just to sum up things for the, the bilingual click and just to give uh, credit to the work of that student, you all know that, but uh, it's, well, it's not bad to repeat that. So you have a lip closure, you have a lip protrusion that she calls lip uh, labialization, you made with the back constriction, and then you have the increase of the, of the, the, the cavity between the lip closure and thing. And for the, uh, by, it's, for the nasal clicks, you have the velum is open during the click production, and we can measure nasal airflow at the same time, and it was done. I haven't shown that to you here. So you have all clicks and nasal clicks, and that is the, the pattern that uh, she has been observing, the combining uh, video, aerodynamic, acoustic, and uh, EGG data. So if we look now at the dental clicks, well, we have the four examples where you have glottal aspirated uh, nasal and glottal and uh, just nasal. Here is the example here. I hope that it's going to work. Oh. Okay, here is the, uh, a nice case of aspirated. Ta -ta. You have two dental clicks and the second one is clearly aspirated. And I think the first one is also, when you look at the oral airflow data, there's little doubt that there is a, a nice aspiration here. So you have nasal, and this is voiceless nasal, by the way, here. Don't add. Okay, and you have now an example of uh, nasal and non glottal Sorry, uh, I have been too fast. Not that. Okay, so... These are the examples of the dental clicks that I wanted to show you, but we found something very interesting looking at this example here, where you have, uh, well, this is the example. Okay, where you have the repetition of three dental clicks. The two first ones are, let's say, plain dental click. The second, the third one is aspirated. And we have uh, measured here oral airflow pharyngeal pressure, and we have on the, on the lower thing, the EGG signature. And it has been allowed, it has allowed us to discuss this, this thing. Well, wait one second, I will 
let me just put it this example here. I, I probably, if if you want to look at that, I well maybe I'm going too fast, but I think the the key example that I want to show, the key point that I want to discuss now is the timing the, the timing of the the gestures involved in that. But let's just go back to that example. Let's go to that example before going back to the first one. Okay, so you have a labialized. Uh, Objective here. We could uh, then we have this lateral aspirated click here. And if you look at, for example, pharyngeal pressure, there is no pharyngeal pressure here, which is quite normal since uh, there has been probably the tube was closed uh, at, at that point. Uh, you will have negative oral airflow at the click release. Sorry, here, here, which is what is expected. And we have reproduced here the oral airflow trees. But the interesting thing is that you have this uh, closure movement because up is the closure for the EGG and down is the opening. So you have a closure, closing movement of the, of, of the glottis towards uh, the, 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 well, the, the, the time when the, the back closure will be released. And then you have a sudden, sudden opening of the glottis at that time, which accounts for the fact that it is an aspirated, uh, an aspirated peak. So all these things can be discussed quite nicely having this set of data. So what I want to discuss, and I think this is one of the key lessons from the Hadza data for, let's say, phonetics and phonological theory, is discussing the control and timing of front and back closure releases in clicks and we have good aerodynamic evidence for Hadda. Uh, here is an example with dental clicks that I took because it is the, well, the nicest to show, but I could take the other two, the others two. In red, you have in blue, you have the audio waveform. In red, you have the intraoral pressure that's given here in hectopascal. An hectopascal is the international measure in physics. It's more precise than to using the centimeter water. So I will stick on that, but it's about the same, the same value. And in green, you have the oral airflow. So what you can see here is that you have at this point here, when you have the arrow number one, you have the lip opening, negative oral airflow, but you can see that there is for a small amount of time, uh, an increase in uh, pharyngeal pressure at that point, which accounts for the fact that the back closure is still there, and then there's still a slight backward movement of the tongue at, at, at that point. And if you doubt that, you can look at that for the voiceless velar stop here. This is the moment where the, the tongue dorsum is closed. There is an increase of the pharyngeal pressure, and then it opens at, at the point where, the, where there is a... The, Pressure goes down when, when it opens. And now this is the, 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 the key example. We go back to the one that I wanted to show you before. And I think it's uh, more precise here. So what you have here is the first plain dental click. You have the red arrow here shows you the moment of the lip opening. The red arrow that going downwards here, it's the back closure release. It's even more obvious here. This is the time where, the, where there is complete closure. And then you have the moment of lip up, uh, of, well, not the lips. Uh, I should, sorry, I should, I should have to be more aware of that. This is the, the, the dent, dental or uh, alveolar release uh, the, when the, the apex of the tongue goes down. And then you have the back closure release here. And you can see there's a slight desynchronization between the two things. And this is very strong evidence for the opening of the first closure and the opening of the second closure in the kick production, which is quite nice because it shows you that, well, we all knew that, but it's nice to see that. And we have that in the, with, with a very precise uh, time measure. It's, uh, the precision is about one millisecond. So it's very accurate. And we can see here, even then, when you have the aspirated dental click here, that you have a huge increase uh, of oral airflow that is not comparable at all with the plain, the plain things that we have here. So by using this kind of data, we are able to make very uh, precise claims about the control and the timing of front and back closure uh, releases in clicks and show that you can make uh, clearly the difference between uh, plain and aspirated clicks. So let's turn now to the, well, the examples of the dentals. Uh, yeah. alve sorry, alveolar. Sorry, I'm going too fast. Here it is. 
Lacan. You have this. Kaku. Aspirated, glottal. Uh, oh, yeah. And then you have this one. Which is... Konana. Okay, so all, I hope that is audible by everybody. So if, if someone doesn't hear, you can complain about that. Uh, so these are, again, the, a, a way to show that they are plain, aspirated, glottal, uh, and nasal clicks, uh, and nasal aspects for the alveolar click. And one example that I like very much is this one, uh, where we have in the same word uh, a glottal alveolar click. Uh, with the uh, affricated, uh, it, uh, two affricated uh, ejectives, and here is what it is, and we will come back for the discussion of that later. Which is a very interesting example uh, to, to discuss. The, the, the unfortunate thing is that we don't have a pharyngeal pressure measurement for that subject that didn't tolerate the tube, so we have only uh, the acoustic data and the oral airflow data. So that's why I haven't put that in the same way that's what I have done before. So the last thing, and then we're going to do some discussion. Okay. So this is the lateral click, uh, which is plain lateral. This is the aspirated. Ah. I think it's pretty obvious the aspirated aspects that we have here. We have glottal and nasal here. Ben and we have the aspirate, and another case of aspiration here. Ah. Okay, so I think this is the cases of aspiration is is pretty obvious uh, in, in in with 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 these three clicks that there shouldn't be much discussion uh, about that. So one thing that I want, and I will come back a little bit later, but I, there's another ex wonderful example that we got from what Andrew and Richard had proposed as last year uh, when we we did that is this 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 word where you have two nasal lateral clicks with uh, the affricated lateral uh, ejective sound. And one the attention, I want to attract your attention to the point that what is pretty obvious is that the acoustic signature of both the lateral click and the affricated lateral has some similarities. And it, it, is, it is an important... Okay. It's not the same, obviously, but there are some similarities, and we are going to discuss that a little bit later. So we go back to this, we sum up all these things to discuss these uh, click features. I go back to what Tony Trail had proposed for the for the clicks uh, that he, he has worked on. So I think what Tony had done was making uh, at the click release uh, a spectrum analysis which allows allowed him to characterize quite nicely what was important in terms of uh, acoustic futures for clicks. And he was using basically abrupt and high or low frequency, abrupt and acute and uh, uh, high and low frequency for clicks. And we have turned that for the, the, we made the same analysis for the Hadza clicks, where we can show that the bilim click is grave and noisy. Uh, the, then the alveolar click is grave and abrupt. You have a, a, a a peak of frequency between two and three thousand hertz for the, the alveolar and then for the uh, uh, dental we have a peak a frequency peak around six thousand hertz when with different completely different acoustic signatures by the way and there is the, the point that i want to discuss and i would be very curious to see to have uh, Bonnie and Jeremy's and, and, and everybody's uh, advice on that thing about how to process uh, the, the lateral click. We, we have been moving our opinion uh, on a regular basis on that because I think that there is an interesting issue with the lateral click in, in Hadza, certainly if you look at from the acoustic data that we have. The lateral click is grave and acute. That's how we have been describing it. But you can put it on also, and you will see that we, we have put it on, on as uh, a, um, uh, high, uh, uh, acute and uh, uh, abrupt and acute. But we will see that in a second. 
It has a short and intense noise between three and 5,000 Hertz, as you can see here. So if you put the peak of frequency, let me put the arrow. So you have 5,000 Hertz here. So you have a band of noise between 3,000 and 500 Hertz. So if you decide that there's a 3,000, that is the key, the key point for the, for the, let's say the auditory or the perceptual aspect, then it's grave, grave. If you put it 5,000, then it's acute. But you have a noise band between three and 5,000 hertz, which is absolutely obvious in most of the data, data that we have. So this is higher than the alveolar and lower than the dental peak. So what do, what do you have to decide? So the decision that we have taken for the acoustic description is the following. There is no surprise for the articulatory description, so I will not discuss that now. But if you look at the acoustic description, you have this filter grave and acute, abrupt, and noisy. So grave is the alveolar and the bilabial peak, and uh, acute is the, we have chosen that the 5,000 hertz is, is, is the most important feature for the lateral click. And so we have decided that it was acute, and then you have another acute, which is the dental peak. I agree that this is debatable, and I would like very much to have a, a return uh, a discussion with you guys about that, because it is it is a, it is not an easy decision to make. If you had only one point, uh, one point, uh, one peak of frequency, the decision would be very easy. But you have a noise band, and this noise band is is really is really is really important to uh, to take into account. And how do we process that in terms of Futures. Uh, that's a decision that we have taken, and uh, but I agree that it's debatable and that there is no uh, clear cut decision that we can that we can make. So one point that uh, is to be discussed about that is how to explain the difference between the dental peaks of Kung and and Hatsa. Uh, if you look at the future that Tony has proposed and that what we are proposing, there's a slight difference, which is in terms of high high. Uh, High frequency for the for the lateral peak, and the reason why we have we propose that is that that might be that the lateral peak could be a lateral version of the palatal peak, or, or uh, where you have a sequence of release. If you have the lateral peak and the palatal peak, you might have you know a, a, a timing of the two the two parts that are released, since it's articulated in the palatal region. You have no. You, you might have a gradual release by the side, which makes that the lateral click could be a kind of, uh, let's say, limited or weakened uh, palatal click. This is an hypothesis that should be worked on with uh, well good comparative data. But I think that is that might be an, an interesting thing, and that makes that there might be a link also with the lateral click and the lateral ejective fricative that we found in the area uh, mainly in the arctic. So look at this word here, where you have an example where we have uh, the lateral click, uh, glot nasal glottal lateral click, and you have the lateral uh, ejective uh, affricate that we have, uh, that is in Hatsa. Look, that is how it sounds. So if you look at the, the acoustic nectar, you have the noise band, the typical noise band of the lateral click here, it's about the same signature, but it's with a weaker intensity for the lateral uh, uh, ejective uh, applicate, uh, lateral ejective applicate. We made some perceptual tests, but I don't think that we have to pay too much attention to that because they were French speakers. And it's not that French speakers suddenly became became dumb or or, or deaf. But I don't think that they were the correct uh, the, the, the correct set of speakers. They were certainly very confused by the two sounds. But since they have never been exposed to these kind of uh, these sounds, I doubt that this is the the the, the, the uh, a definitive analysis. We should use speakers that are, are well all the area and bring uh, some perceptual sense to the field. But the acoustic signature between the lateral and the lateral ejective is pretty is pretty confusing, uh, both in terms of audition and perception. And if you look at the spectral signature, it's quite similar too. We, you might find a peak here for the 
for the lateral one, but I think in both cases, in that particular example, it is pretty confusing and acoustically, there is some confusion to be observed. So the other point that I want to discuss without taking too much of your time uh, is larynx movements uh, that exist for clicks and ejectives. And so here is a wonderful example that we have been recording with Andrew and Richard. Look at the EGT. What what is what is pretty what is pretty sensational with that speaker is that usually when you have an EGG, the larynx pass it's not it's well it's we, we didn't we didn't screw the, the, the EGG electrodes on the thyroid of, of that speaker. But it, that were, that they were holding on the thyroid cartilage, which shows that nice, very nicely the up and down movements of, of the larynx. So it works for ejectives, as you all know that when you produce an ejective, you have a, an elevation of the larynx. But in the return of the clicks, you have also an elevation of the larynx, which adds another a, a, another point on the similarity between clicks and ejectives. And I will come back on that in a second. So just the example of uh, an, exa an example of um, ejective sound I took the bilabial because for that speaker we had uh, uh, internal pressure, oral airflow, and EGG uh, for, for for the for the data. Here is the word. <coughs> so on top you have the spectrogram uh, with the blue is the audio waveform, the orange is the EGG. And then in green, you have internal pressure, and in purple, you have all airflow. And uh, so we will look at that one by one. So you have here uh, the EGG that is put with the audio waveform. And what I can tell you here is that you have a closure of the glottis. And then since there is no movement, the signal goes slowly down and go up. This is because the electric resistance has a certain shape. And that is that shows that the, the glottis is closed. There is uh, uh, between, there is a slight move down opening movement, but then again a closure here during the, the part between the, the burst release and the beginning of the following vowel. Here the glottis is closed for the, 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 the glottal stop that you have here. And so we can, by superimposing uh, EGG signals with the acoustics uh, and with the audio waveform, we can have a, a quite precise way of looking at what happens uh, at the glottis. So here is the, the, the intraoral pressure uh, and the oral airflow. You can see that there is, the lips are probably becoming closed here. So the larynx elevation, which was quite high, I will show you the values in a second. And uh, you have uh, at the moment when the lips open, well, you have oral airflow coming out. But there's also uh, a negative oral airflow at that point, which shows that it's probably that there is a downward movement of the larynx at that point and a, and, and a kind of opening of, of the cavity. So if you look at that thing here, these are the, the, the scales because we need to put scales. Well, we have, for example, for the internal pressure that's given in green here, we, re we reach about 40 hectopascal, which is uh, a little more than 40 centimeters for water, if you want, which is quite considerable. And if you look at the backward uh, ejectives, it goes even higher. So we have very high values for the uh, for the internal pressure in these things, and you have the same values are given here for the oral airflow, which is not the main point. But one point that I want to attract your attention, again, is the ejective and the glottal sounds. Look, this is the first example uh, before the... This is the second. And this is the third one. There is one thing here that I want, just in passing, say we have a laryngalized vowel that could be by chance, but I don't, don't think that it is. Uh, look at now at what we have around the ejective sounds in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, EGG signature. So this is 
where you have the signal, the first arrow is each time before the birth release and the segment after, we have three different words and each time is the same signature. So there are clearly patterns of, glot of, of glottal signature around adjectives and around clicks in the language that are very important. And if you compare speakers, these patterns do repeat themselves. So this is not by chance. We go in, in some very sophisticated way of controlling and manipulating the glottis that probably has important consequences. I would say in terms of sociophonetics, but I'm not sure about that. It's probably Andrew and Richard that, and, and Jeremy that can say much more than, and, and Boni, much more than me on, on that point. But certainly in terms of diachronic aspects, I wouldn't be surprised that it plays a role. And the other point is that if you look at the green arrows here, that is that could be described as a glottal stop and there is no glottal closure here. But the fact that the, that the, the EGG signal and the acoustic signal that go down and up again with the, with the, with the, you know a, a sharp change between the downward and the upward movement perceptively accounts for the fact that we do interpret that as a glottal closure while a real glottal closure is this one and this one but that is interpreted as a glottal closure there is no diphthong here clearly okay so that is one point so links between clicks and ejectives i think the lateral click has a similar articulation to that of the palatal lateral ejective in Hatsa. It remains a hypothesis, but I think it's important in terms of language contact and diachronic process. The lateral ejective is the Hadza variant of uh, that lateral ejective that we have in, in, in Iraq. And there, there is very little doubt, and it's very confusing for all speakers that I have been asking to, 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 to identify the, the two sounds. So we should do more in the field about that in, in the future. And so the glottal uh, dental click and the affricated uh, ejective, uh, the click has a lingual initiation, swallowing type of movement, and the ejective return movement is produced with the glottal lick initiation. And I will show you that in a second. So one point that uh, all this discussion uh, made me discuss with some of my colleagues is the following point: Is are the clicks, uh, you know, remnants of all things of all things by humans? Well, clicks occur in language spoken by people uh, whose common genetic ancestor lived more than thirty-five year, thousand years ago, perhaps as long as fifty thousand years ago. If you look at the data, I gave I gave some data, but there are more data available for that. But I would like very much to go back to the hypothesis that has been, or the discussion that has been introduced by Boni and Tom about uh, the, the oldness of clicks. Clicks are no more likely to be retained than other speech sounds. But how can we account for that and how can we discuss that? Well, I think that uh, we, we have worked with John Kingston on a paper that it has been submitted, but it's on an embargo. So I don't want to put that on, but I can certainly discuss that freely with you today, is that we believe that clicks and non pulmonic consonants are a reuse of swallowing mechanism, of biomechanical movements involving swallowing mechanism. And we have a lot of evidence for that. So what Boni and, and Tom have also said is that they might have Clicks might have been innovated independently in the languages where they now belong in their consonant inventories, and clicks emerge in question languages with, uh, ling in, within a linguistic area where there is already a great diversity of sound and sound system and an environment that would dynamically encourage further increases in complexity. So the whole, the whole idea, and I think I personally back completely Bonnie and Tom in, in that idea, is that click is not something that is all to mankind. It's probably something that has been developed uh, all, over the time and that accounts for a complexification process that we have in sound systems. We have quite a lot of evidence for that, that in fact, this is a reuse of swallowing movement. And you could say, why not in, in other places? Well, there are some, some ways to respond to that thing. And this is the idea of speech embodiment. Uh, so if we look at, I, I just put that very simply here because it's too long to discuss uh, in, in detail, but if you look at the four, four phases of swallowing mechanism, you can see that you have the, the larynx, when you have, in, when you swallow, you have first the 
a closure in the front, then a closure in the back, and then you have an elevation of the larynx, and then this is the beginning of the swallow. This is barium, by the way, that the speaker was uh, swallowing a kind of uh, not very nice mixture of what is called barium that allows you to see to, to see the, the, the swallowing process. And that is the same thing, the same process that you have with the, the, with the palatal click. Look at the different position of the epiglottis. This is probably the, the easier landmark to look at. It's pretty high when the double closure is done, and it's pretty high when the double closure is done for the swallow, the, the swallowing thing. And then it goes, it, it, it goes down. Here it's hidden by the barium, and since there's no barium here, you can see just that the epiglottis is here. And for ejective, is the return mechanism of the swallowing mechanism is what accounts for ejective. So clicks and ejective are linked by some biomechanical movements. That, that there, there are some common processes between the two of them. Okay, so the paper should be should be out uh, pretty soon. And the last thing that I wanted to present to you that we have been working on is the prenasalized consonants that we have uh, in uh, in Hadza that are very interesting because they show a lot of interesting features. So here is the word that we have been discussed that we're going to discuss. Okay, so you have. Above you have the spectrogram and the audio waveform, and below you have in blue the audio waveform, in, in green the EGG. So you can see here that the voicing stops uh, before the, be, the, there is a small lag between the, the stop of the voicing for the nasal and uh, the voiceless uh, velar stop. And you have a huge space that accounts for the aspiration that you have in that case. And if you doubt what I show you, I'm going to show the same thing with the oral and the nasal airflow that we have here. In purple, you have the nasal airflow that stops, uh, that decreases and stops at the end of the voice of velar stop. And you have, when you open the velar, the, the velar closure, you have this, uh, this big uh, oral airflow that accounts for, that lasts for probably something like uh, 60 milliseconds or something like that. Okay, so this is this is clearly an aspirated. Okay, and so the last example that I wanted to show you, where you have uh, the, the same the same kind of data that we have been processing for all the prenasalized, but it takes more time than uh, than what we thought, and since. Uh, we are either old or slow now. Uh, it takes a little bit time to 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 be discussed. So here is the word. One thing that is interesting in this example is that it accounts for the same pattern where you have a pre an aspirated prenasalized consonant that is pretty obvious. Uh, I think you have in, in red you have the oral airflow. And in purple, you have the nasal airflow, and then you have the combination of the two that is pretty nice to see. And you have the typical signature in purple here, by the way, of a nasal, uh, of a plain nasal consonant, that where you have an increase of nasal airflow, then a kind of plateau and a gradual decrease on the following vowel. The following vowel is interesting because it's laryngalized. And I thought that it was just by chance. And we looked at all the male speakers that we have been recording, and they all produce a laryngalized consonants there. So I don't know how to interpret that, and if there is a specific phonation type uh, at work in uh, in Hatsa for these things, and probably Jeremy or or Bonnie will 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 give some positions about that that I cannot propose. So this is basically what we have done with the data that we've been recording uh, with Richard and. Um, and Andrew uh, some time ago, that they are still being processed. All the data for the clicks have been processed. We have just to sum up things, make nice uh, statistical, statistical measurements are partially done by the way, but we have to put everything together and, uh, and make that available. Uh, at least uh, we promised to Andrew that we would make that publicly available. We have been horribly slow to do that. I'm very sorry about that. But it's it's going to be done, and we're not going to hide anything to anybody. And hopefully, we will make papers about at least the the, the clicks and the, and and the, the prenasalized thing. So that is what I had to present you today, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. So we can go straight into the discussion. 
Good morning. Go ahead. Thanks, DDA. Well, I have a lot of comments and questions, and I don't want to monopolize the session here, so we, I might have to chat with you a bit uh, later. Uh, first question about the lateral click and the ejective lateral Africa. You said something about perception, but these were French speakers, and just speaking from my own experience, I can totally tell those two apart. I have no question at all which is which. So. Uh, did you do any perception experiments with Hadza speakers? No, that's that's what we have to do. What we have, I would like very much to do that with Hadza and Iraqi speakers. And impressively, we did that with uh, some Iraqi speakers, asking them to, to, to make the difference uh, with a couple of Iraqi speakers that we've met, and they were confused. But again, it's not the the normal way to make a perceptual experiment. So I don't want to take any conclusions from that. But, yeah, but I think so, Jeremy and uh, Richard and Andrew would agree with me that once you're familiar with them, you, you have no trouble telling those two apart yeah, whatsoever. I completely, I completely so agree with that, but I think that that is that is absolutely no doubt about that. But I think that what what is certainly a fact is that if you look at the acoustic signature between the lateral and the uh, and the lateral, well, the ejective lateral there is something in common between both of them and the key point is just a difference in intensity so if you slightly increase the intensity of the lateral uh, affricate then it becomes very confusing uh, even if i'm used now to use these things mm -hmm. if i increase of uh, between 5 and 10 db 5 and 10 db the intensity of the lateral uh, ejective uh, affricate it's getting very, very confused. And Tony had done in the old time in his perceptual studies of of, uh, of clicks, he has shown that for some some of the of the sounds, the intensity filter is a key point. For example, when you have click loss or click changes, and so these things might play a role in some diachronic process, or maybe when you have contacts between languages, where you have you know speakers that in the beginning are not used to hear one or the other, there might be some possible confusion in that thing. So I agree completely with you that when you know the thing, there is no doubt you, know, you can make the difference. But the confusion is possible in certain types of circumstance, and it's just the, to understand what happens in contact issues and in diachronic issues. But that that's a specific work that we have. If I may jump yeah. in with just a little anecdote, just to spice up the conversation about it. Uh, it's true that, yeah, for me, having listened to the language a lot, I can tell the difference between them, but there was one time, one anecdote that I was sitting in, in, in uh, eliciting a, a word and they said it to me and I repeated it back and they said, no, that's not correct. And I said, so then I repeated it again. They said, no, that's still not correct. And I could not figure out what it was that I was doing that was incorrect. And then suddenly it clicked and they, they said, no, you're doing the, they didn't say these words, but they said, no, you're doing the ejective. This is the click or, or vice versa. I can't remember. So I was actually perceiving it as the, the lateral ejective when it was actually the lateral click. And then immediately I realized what I was doing wrong and we, we changed it. But so it, ha it has happened where even I've been tricked by the difference between these two things. But generally speaking, yes, I'm able to tell the difference between them. Yeah, but thanks for that comment, Jeremy, because there's one thing that we did badly, because I'm bonus here, so I'm a bit ashamed to talk about that. We did bad palatal graphics. Oh, I, I've done things badly too with Hadza, so there's no but shame. The, We're just- uh... there, there is one thing that with the lateral and the, the, and the lateral ejective Af uh, Africate, when you, when you look at the, 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 the lateral click and, and you combine, uh, the, combine the thing that you have, you have a close, uh, uh, let's say the, the tongue dorsum is much more front when you make a lateral click compared to the other clicks. That's the first point. The second point is that there is, if you look acoustically, there is, the, the, the release is made in two phases in, 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 in the back part. And so that reminds very much the move, the, 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 the kind of articulatory movement that you have with, with the lateral uh, ejective affricate. So th there are some possible confusion about that. And I probably would be probably worse than you, Jeremy, producing these kind of things with speakers. But I think this is, this is clearly something that has to be looked at 
and looking at these contact issues and diaconic or borrowing issues, I think possible confusion in terms of acoustics, uh, uh, close articulatory movement, I think they do favor some, some kind of process in terms of diaconic or borrowing. But we have to demonstrate that, of course. I mean, it's not enough to, to claim that. I don't see anyone on their hands raised going to continue, but I, I should say, you know, this is all fantastic day. This is wonderful. I mean, this is some raises so many groups. And I love that you showed the downward movement of the larynx with the clicks. I mean, I realized I knew that anecdotally because and felt it had something to do with moving the tongue. But, you know, to have that as part of the representation and have that quantified, that's really important, I think. Uh, so uh, another comment is that the lateral uh, you, you, you need to, if you think about the back vowel constraint, a lot of Southern African Khoisan languages don't allow back clicks next to front vowels, yet Hadza allows the lateral to co-occur, you know, before an A and an E vowel, so it should be, it does characteristics of, say, an acute sort of click okay. language. You know, so there is that, and and and, and I do feel like the the Hadza lateral sounds a bit different than Southern African Khoisan laterals. So your idea of comparing the lateral with fricated palatals and with other laterals, cross linguistically, I think that's a, a really good idea, uh, something that we that should be done. Um, and as far okay, two more comments. As far as the laryngealized vowels in that Mpalamakwako, that is at the edge of. Uh, I would say of an inter intonational phrase, you've got the copula yeah. Yeah. afterwards. And so maybe that's that. I can't remember what the context of the first example was. And then your ka -ka -ha, ka -ka -ka -ha slide, yeah, if you yeah, could yeah. go to that for a second. Ka -ka -ka, okay. If you could show that slide. The uh, middle yeah. vowel is quite a bit shorter and lower amplitude than the other two. And, uh, you know, there's some controversy in the literature about whether Hadza has stress or mm -hmm. not. And no, uh, the the three dental clicks where the third one is aspirated. Yeah. That's, 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 the one. that's the one here. Yeah. No, that one, <laughs> you just passed it, that one. Yeah, so I would call that middle one like less, um, you know, it seems unstressed compared to the other two. And so I, I just put that out there. It's definitely shorter. It's got a lower amplitude. If we're not, okay. n nobody's really <laughs> talked about the metrics of Hadza yet so much. I mean, that's kind of, I'm just saying that first well, you're thinking, I'll look you're stressed. Me, yeah, okay. No, I agree. It's, I haven't looked at that at all. Uh, yeah, I was just so happy to be able to show from either dynamic data that we were able to show the timing you know, of this front and, and back closure releases in, in clicks that uh, I didn't pay attention to the rest, but you're absolutely right looking at the thing now. And That's probably, the problem with working I mean, on HUD, that you pay yeah. attention to one thing and then there's like three other things that you're not paying attention to because there's just so much there's going on, but it's such a, a goldmine for phonetics. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can make comment here Yeah. Uh, on, on both of the, so the Palama Oako, uh, the laryngealized ah, so, I mean, according to my data, there is a glottal stop between the A ah and the O. So that's why you're getting laryngealization of the vowel is because it's okay. the reduction of the glottal stop and you just get glottalization. Okay. That makes complete sense then. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. And then on this, uh, this one particularly, I also noticed this and wanted to bring it up at the end. Uh, this context is the, it's a, a reduplicated prefix, ta, ta, ta. It is just a rock. So you have the just pre prefix being attached here, and the prefix actually has a long vowel. So it's ta 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 ha. And so that's yeah. why there's, there's a longer vowel here than there is for the second one, because this is a long vowel prefix that's being attached okay. to the front. Thanks, Jeremy. Oh, yeah. Thanks <laughs> for that. Oh, actually, there's one, I have one other comment about what Bunny was talking about. Most of what Bunny is going to be mentioning and talking about is also going to be things that I have comment on as well. Um, but so specifically looking at the glottal movement, I think this is very interesting and I don't have an answer exactly for us right now, but I do have an observation that I can talk about from my own research. And that is, uh, this movement of the glottis. So I have ultrasound data where I've looked at these clicks being produced and for the, 
alveolar. So what I call post alveolar, and I have data to show that it's actually more post alveolar than it is alveolar, uh, central click and the lateral click. When you have the production of the click, you have a front closure and the back closure. And you can see in the ultrasound data that you have the full closure. And then just before the release of the anterior closure, you get a back, almost a rocking back of the tongue. So the tongue dorsum moves back in yeah. the ultrasound just before you get the opening of the front closure. And so I've been observing this, but I don't have in information of the tongue root in my ultrasound data. But what it looks like is the tongue's being pulled back. And it could be that what we're seeing is the lowering of the larynx, which is pulling the, the dorsum of the tongue backwards. And it's definitely something that happens in the larynx. We completely agree on that. And I think that what happens is that, as Bonnie was mentioning, there is a, a downward movement of the larynx accompanying the whole process. But there is also, if you look at the, the plan of the vocal folds, this, that's, let's say that is the, the aritone is here and the tyrid notch is here. What happens is that it moves like that too. So you can have the larynx going up and down and this thing going in, in this way too. And this accounts for this kind of, you know, curve movement that we have. But it goes certainly along with, uh, the biomechanically, it's linked what, what, you, what you just mentioned with the top dorsum lowering. There's no, the, the, this is, in fact, I have ob evidence of that from the X-rays movies. But again, I'm not a native speaker, so I don't want to, to make uh, claims from observation made on me. But uh, I just took the opportunity, by the way, that, I had uh, I had a surgery and then the doctor said to me, well, we want to, to do something. And I said, well, I do that if you make me an X-ray move me of me, of me producing clicks, ejective, implosives, and all these things. That's how I have the data. <laughs> well, you have I thought that looked like you rather than a Hadza person there in the X-rays. <laughs> I thought that head is too large. No. Uh, I, had, I had two more comments. One, the, the the lateral, I think, does have an alveolar closure at the start rather than a palatal closure at the start. And that's a comment for Andrew as well. So I would spell that with uh, the T. But I agree that the, uh, the frication location is a little further back. And then my other question is, uh, when you measure duration, is that the closure plus the attack plus the extinction burst? Or what, what did you count as duration? Well, we counted the duration of the, the clicks. Well, the click itself, yeah. we measured that from the beginning of the, well, let me just, put, uh, well, for example, it's the, it's the Tony's process. In, 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 in fact, we, we've been working, he and me, on that thing for a while when I was in Botswana with him. Uh, well, it's complicated to show here. Wait, wait, I think there are other ways to do that. Probably here. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the the duration that we measured for the for total duration for the click, for example, for the dental is from here to here. For the, the alveolar is from here to here. For the lateral is from here to here. Okay. Oh, so it's really just the burst that you're talking yeah, about. The burst yeah. that we've been and then we have measured the click accompaniment, uh, which is the 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 time of the glottal closure, the time of the aspiration after, and then we have been also measuring the whole, the total, the total duration of the thing that I haven't shown, but it's not, it's not, it's not the important point here. Mm -hmm. But if you want to have the data, I can see that. And where will we look for your paper with John Kingston? Where, where is that coming out in? It has been uh, set so one of the things I found interesting that uh, also mirrors what I found in my research is you were looking at the duration of the aspirated versus the glottalized clicks. I think it was just yeah. a few slides from here and found that the glottalized click was longer than the aspirated click. Yeah. I also have found the same thing in my research where I only looked at VOT. I was just looking at VOT from the the release burst, the, onset, okay. the beginning of the release burst to the onset of voicing. And I found the same thing that the glottalized click is longer than the aspirated clicks in terms oh, of VOT. Did you hear that? Okay. Yeah, so that's interesting as well. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask about was at the very beginning, you mentioned the, the number of clicks. So quantifying 
both click the combination of the click accompaniments with the click types. And there were some there was some discrepancy that I wanted to ask about. Um, I don't know. It's one of the very first slides that showed there was the thirteen clicks. Well, I may have been incoherent for something because I have been well, well wait. This thing here. Uh, well, yes, that's. The one. Yeah. So I noticed in the dental click, it shows that there are. Uh, so for each click, you have four different accompaniments, but yeah. the, the accompaniments that are listed for each click type differ. Uh, in that, let me see where did I, the yeah, lateral you're not click, always... yeah, the lateral click you mark an unaspirated, aspirated, nasalized, oh, okay. and glottalized. Well, it may and be, then for the alveolar, you have glottalized, aspirated, nasalized, and nasal glottalized. So there's no unaspirated accompaniment for the that one. And the same thing for the dental, but you do have an unaspirated for the lateral. Yeah, I, have I was check. assuming this was just an error and not. Yeah, it that. is probably that. I have to check, but I think I probably made a mistake here, no doubt. Yeah, I, that's what I assume it was just a transcription uh, error. Okay, but, but I will check. Thanks for that. Yeah, no problem. Um, and then the other comment was about the. So Bonnie mentioned whether the uh, the palatal affricate should be transcribed with an alveolar closure, stop closure, or a palatal stop closure. Me and Bonnie have been mes mes messaging about this, and I showed her some data in my ultrasound where I show that the stop closure for the palatal affricate is identical to the stop to the closure of the lateral fricative, the alveolar lateral fricative sa. Um, so it does confirm that there is an alveolar closure as opposed to a palatal closure for the palatal lateral affricate. Um, okay. But as as Bonnie mentioned, the affrication does seem to be much more posterior than the lat than the, the alveolar fricative, um, which I think is interesting because you mentioned this question about whether the lateral should be considered acute or grave and how it's different from Southern African Khoisan laterals, for example. And I think this what may be interesting here is in my ultrasound data, definitely if I know this for sure the anterior closure of the lateral affricate is not the same as the anterior closure of the lateral click. The lateral okay. click is much more retracted, more post alveolar, almost to palatal, as opposed I to an alveolar not. closure. Yeah, I think it's palatal. Uh, yeah. I yeah, think so in our palatography data, the click was more um, laminal. We called it laminal, the lateral click, if I recall correctly. Yeah, and I would yeah, agree with Which that. goes with what you're saying. Yeah, but yeah. I think, and I so think... well, the the if you're saying that the two the the lateral affricate and the lateral click have similar signatures in terms of acoustics, the 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 place of articulation, if you want to think of it that way, on the lateral where it's being released is probably very close to the same, even though the anterior closure is different, where it's being released into the molars back here is probably very similar, which is why we're getting similar acoustic signatures. I agree with you. That's what I was trying to say before, that in this thing that, you know, in the phases of release and the, and the lateral thing is absolutely crucial. I think this is, this is what makes the, contributes to this acoustic signature that we have to work on to go back to the initial discussion with Bonnie. But I think that if you have a palatal closure and you have this lateral release, that is, and in this niche phase, it's in the release. I think it's obviously where the where, where the thing will be will have to be to, to be worked on, and where we will really find the solution. Yeah, which as a, a little plug for my own data, uh, that's part of the issue with the description, the phonetic and the articulatory description of the lateral click, is for all of the other clicks that are not lateral, we tend to to conceptualize these clicks, you know, in two dimensions along the mid sagittal and we show, okay, yeah. here's the, here's what it looks like for the lateral click. That information is much less relevant than what is going on, uh, you know, in the, in the lateral margins of the tongue, but we have no information about what actually is going on other than palatographic. That's where your contribution will be, will, will be, will make some, a lot of new, new things. Dying to see that, sir. Yeah, we're getting close to having some of that. Some, some uh, times when uh, Kirk and I would listen to the uh, glottalics, we thought we heard some sort of 
laryngeal lowering, almost implosive kind of sound to it. I, 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 I'm fascinated what you're talking about that noise in the in the relatively silent period after the click burst and mm -hmm. before the vowel. You know how how much information is in there, and uh, did you see any patterns to when you saw what you called nasal versus you know non nasal glottalized clicks? And I, and I'd be curious how that might go with the larynx lowering gesture, because that kind of seems like a. You give me an idea where to, to do something, but I have no answer for you for the moment, Dory. And if there's no further comments or questions, I think I'll close the discussion. Well, I think I will. Um, so thank you very much, Dia, for the presentation. Um, and looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 20th of March presented by Andrew, uh, and it's titled The Retrospective of the Rift Valley Network Webinar Series, uh, Year 5. Well, thank you, everybody, for the nice discussion. It's really, it was really worth talking with you guys. Thank you.